Okay, so today you got two handouts. One is for exercise 112, and the other is for assignment 107. And no, I, I do know how to count. Uh, I did deliberately skip from uh, 103 to 107, and that is because I give you 107 now, but it's due, it's your final assignment for the semester. And so because we're in the InDesign section of the class, it makes sense to actually start this and start talking about the portfolios. Um, but recognize that this is, in fact, your final uh, for the class, and you have the next three months or so to work on it. Um, because you have the next three months or so to work on it, I have very high expectations <laughs> for how it will turn out, which is a good thing. Um, we're going to spend a little bit more time in this class, and I've already adjusted the schedule a bit, so that we can really focus on getting a good portfolio. And I feel like uh, in the trend of portfolios has gone kind of the wrong direction and that people are rushing and not really creating good portfolios anymore. Um, and it's, it's kind of a global trend. It's not just related to this class. So I'm going to try to pull that back and really focus on it and make sure that we go through it. Um, normally for this exercise or this lecture 112, I spend a lot of time in InDesign just talking about what masters are and, and how do you work with the various uh, page concepts. But before I do that today, I want to show some examples of really nice portfolios, just so that you have kind of in the back of your mind what, what's going on in the world of portfolios and, and who's making really good portfolios, et cetera. Uh, there's a site um, called Issue, ISSU.com, something like that, um, that has, if you type in architecture portfolio, many of you may have already done that, uh, has a lot of really great architecture portfolios um, to look at. Uh, I will show a couple examples of them today, but I also want to talk about some of the programmatic things related to a portfolio. And so I think all too often uh, a portfolio is, is fundamentally a story about you, and it's about you as a designer, and, and, and it's a brand about you, and it's, it's kind of the summary or the culmination of your work. And we use it in two contexts in the architectural world. One is for school-related things. So uh, you, you're moving on to Berkeley. You're moving on to Cal Poly. You may get asked to show a portfolio uh, to help with where you're placed in, in that. Let's say you get into Cal Poly. You might have to show a portfolio, and they decide what year you come in. So your portfolio is really valuable. Okay? Uh, in the world of Berkeley, sometimes they'll ask for a portfolio at the beginning of a design studio. And um, in a Berkeley design studio, you might have 60 or 80 people that are broken up into groups of 10 to 12. And to decide which group of 10 to 12 you get placed in, they might ask to see your portfolio. And it doesn't necessarily mean that they're going to take the top 12 and put them in one group and then the bottom 12 and put them in another group. A lot of times it has to do with what your interests are and can they align you and your interests with one of the faculty people that has similar interests to push you further as a student. Does that kind of make sense? So if you're, you're, you're looking at a portfolio just as hey, this is all my work, and not really thinking about it as a reflection of who you are and what your interests are, you're doing yourself a disservice. One of the examples that I have from many years ago, I'd say this is in 2008, 2009, something like that. I had a student here who got into Berkeley, uh, actually two students. One, both of them got into Berkeley. They both showed up on the first day of um, the um, 100A studio, which is the first big studio at uh, Berkeley that you're going to go into. And they said, let me see your portfolio. And one of my students had a portfolio totally prepared, ready to go um, based on work that he'd done. And that portfolio had a lot of digital work in it. And it was kind of in line with what his interests were. The other student who, who got in, same place, all the rest of it, didn't have a pre prepared portfolio and decided to just show him some work. And so the quickest work that they could get to was the work that they did for 131, which was a bunch of freehand drawing. So the Berkeley studio in 100A decided who to place in what studio. One student got in the advanced digital studio, and they did a bunch of Rhino modeling. And the other student, who was interested in the Rhino modeling and all the rest of it, ended up being placed in the freehand drawing studio. And so he got to spend the whole semester freehand drawing. The point is, this has a direct reflection of who you are and where you're going. Okay? So that's the school side of a portfolio. The opposite of that is the work side. And the two don't always coincide. So the portfolio that you use for school might be entirely different than the portfolio you use for work. 
recognizing, of course, that a work portfolio or, or a portfolio that you're using to get a job a lot of times is more skill-based than anything else. You want to demonstrate that you have these certain skills and this, this certain aptitude for certain things that they're looking for. And so how you blend the two becomes really important or, or how you distinguish the two. And I think um, as long as you're being truthful to who you are, what your skills are, what your interests are, your portfolio is generally going to be a lot better than something that's just kind of a, a conglomeration of things. So think about what makes you different or unique. You should have some form of an intro page. And this is a little bit of a uh, touchy subject, depending um, if you have a limit on your number of pages. And so if you, if you let's say you're applying to grad school at Berkeley, um, when I applied, there was a limit of 12 pages. That was the maximum length of your portfolio. And I used to have my uh, grad school portfolio, and I can't seem to find it anymore. So somebody might have walked off of it. But anyway, um, the point is that when you're limited in page number, sacrificing a whole page uh, as your intro page may not be exactly what you want to do, but you might be able to wrap it into something else. For the scope of this class or the, for the scope of a job, having an intro page is great. It's a great way of kind of identifying, hey, here's information about me the designer, here's information about the projects that you're about to see. right? So it's, it could be like a table of contents sort of thing. It could be something like this with a little bit of an image coupled with a little bit of information. right? Very simple, but it's a, it's a precursor to what's to come in the portfolio. It's some way of organizing this as a whole. Um, sometimes you have additional information about yourself. I'll show you some examples where people have actually included like almost resume-like information as part of it, which, if you're applying for a job, might be relevant. If you're applying for grad school, maybe not so much. Uh, and so you just have to kind of weigh that out. The other thing is you need to keep your portfolio current. So portfolio, all too often, isn't a static thing. right? You don't just create it and then walk away from it and assume that that same portfolio is going to work five years down the road. Um, you're always creating new work, especially in school. Where you are right now, some of you might just be in 121, and you're looking forward, maybe, to 220 and 221 as the next two studios that you're going to take. After you take 220, right, great time to update por your portfolio because you have two new really fantastic projects to put in there. Right? If uh, right now, let's say you're in 121, you might not have anything from 120 yet, one yet. You might not have your Mondrian Museum. You might not have your Calder Museum, or maybe you're about to have that. The point is that. Design is always an evolution. There's always some new project. There's always something better that you want to show. Right? If I were redoing my portfolio right now, right, I'd need to put in what I'm currently working on, the current projects that I have, not the stuff that I did in grad school, because it's too old. Okay? So if, if your project's older than three to five years, assuming that you have newer, better projects to put in in the first place, generally it should have the newer, better projects in it. Um, if you don't have newer and better projects, then maybe I should question why you're in this field in the first place. Um, but the point is, keep it updated. right? The other thing is, it's kind of a living document. So you should always feel like, oh, I need to add another couple pages. And if you're in the world of InDesign, which is obviously what we're talking about right now, it's really easy to add more pages or to cut pages out or to put pages at the end or put pages in front of other pages. So you can always put new pages in and keep the old pages and decide to cut them off later. Um, and that's one of the advantages of working in something like InDesign. The other thing that's important is to understand what is the purpose of any given piece that you're putting in a portfolio. So why are you putting it in? What are you trying to show with this? And this has more to do with the skills that you're trying to show as opposed to the project. And so in this context, um, if I was doing, say, the Mondrian Museum, for example, um, in a portfolio, I'd be wanting to show certain design skills, certain, certain skills that I might have. And I would demonstrate those skills through a variety of methods, whether it's a, you know, a photograph of the model I built, or whether it's some drawings, or, or whatever. Okay? I'm trying to showcase the design. If I was to include assignment 102, the Photoshop example, the purpose of including that would be to, hey, I know how to manipulate photos in Photoshop. Right? So you want to think about what the, what the purpose is, and does that purpose belong in your portfolio? Obviously, if you're, if you're pushing the design side of things, you might have more projects that are dealing with design, but they might show a versatility of design. So they might all be about design, but one might be a, a modernist design, and the other might be a very traditional design or whatever. And you're using those to show your versatility in the design field. 
So you just want to think about why are you including this particular piece in your portfolio. So the other really touchy subject about portfolios is group work. And I was searching for an example of uh, a good quality example of, of how people have dealt with this. And I, I, didn't, I didn't find one yet, but I will find one eventually. And I'll show it to you the next time we talk about, about portfolios. But all too often, you get placed in a group, and you guys do a project together. So let's say you're in the Cal Poly Design Village. Okay? Uh, you do this, this, um, this you know, whatever pavilion thing that's going to go to, to Cal Poly. You're going to set it up. You're going to take a bunch of photos. But you personally are probably going to be responsible for one particular part of this whole design process. So you obviously want to show this is what the end result is, but then you want to focus in on what your part was in this particular design. Okay? So when it's group work, you can't claim the whole design is your own, because obviously there were other people providing input. And so certainly you provide input, you get to place the main images and stuff on your computer. But if you, if you did the primary renderings, then take credit for the renderings. You know, this is the part of the project that I did. Right? If you did all the electronics work and how the lighting worked and something, then take credit for the fact that you did that part of it. Uh, so you do want to own which part of the group work that you actually did, in addition to showing the group work as a whole. Recognize that if, let's say, you're at Berkeley and you're showing your portfolio, and the people that you were in a group with are also at Berkeley showing their portfolio, the, the people that are reviewing your portfolio are going to see the same work two or three times because all three of you are in the same group. So if all of you claim that this is my own project with nobody else, it doesn't really work because the people that are reviewing it have seen it three times. And they're like, wait a minute, whose project is this? So you want to own the fact that it's a group project, but this is what is important, and this is what I worked on in relation to the group work. A killer portfolio is very well designed, and that's the truth of it. The best portfolios out there, and I'm going to show you a variety of examples uh, as we go forward, all of which have been very carefully considered. They all have some kind of a framework behind them. They might be more freeform um, than the, the rigid grid design. Sometimes they have a lot of rigid grid. It's, it's going to vary depending on who's designing it and, and what they're doing. But there's a lot of consistency across the portfolio. Flow lines stay consistent across the portfolio. Fonts, font sizes, margins, length of lines, Columns, those are all consistent page to page to page. And that's part of what makes it work really nicely. Uh, one of the things that happens in a portfolio is you, you kind of have to evolve the portfolio in relation to all the variety of work that you're creating. And sometimes you have to adapt and you have to make it work. But if you're consistent and you use the same fonts and you use the same you know, paragraph lengths and that sort of thing, generally speaking, it'll, it will end up being a very nice final product. Um, so trust your intuition. We talked a lot about intuition, what looks right, what doesn't look right. One of the biggest problems with the portfolios that come out of this class is the fonts are too big. Almost always the fonts are too big because people think they're going to write more text than they actually have either uh, have space for or the, the space that they, they left is really big and they feel like they have to fill it up, so the font gets too big. Um, when that happens, it immediately breaks and it doesn't look good. So you just want to think about all those little details. And uh, the hope is that you'll be far enough along with this that we can sit down and I can redline it and say, no, this font is too large. This is too, you know, this is too small, whatever. Those kinds of details really, really matter in the design process. Great portfolios take time to evolve. right? That's why I'm giving you assignment 107 right now with three months to go um, so that you have time to evolve this. Right? You might start on something today, and you might decide, you know what, I really don't like it anymore, and I want to move on to something else. I want to change my design. When I applied to grad school, obviously that was the most important portfolio I felt like I was doing at the time, um, or that I had ever done. I did seven complete portfolios before I settled on the one that I liked. So it took me seven tries to get to the final version. And so that's the truth of it. It just takes time. Sometimes they were too dense. Sometimes they had problems. Somewhere in my office, I have old ones. And you can see the drafts as I was going through. And some of them were incomplete. But I, I did enough of it to know that I wouldn't really like it. Um, and that's important to consider. So really trust your intuition on what works. So I'm going to show you a variety of examples. Recognize that a lot of these are spreads, which means they split in the middle. The left page and the right page work together as, as, an, as a cohesive piece. Um, the next four, five, six slides are by a guy uh, named Alex Holgreff, who does great architectural visualizations. He actually works not for an architecture firm, but as an independent visualization specialist. So 
firms would hire him to do the graphics for them on the big boards and whatever. He's extraordinarily good. He has a great website called Visualizing Architecture. Um, does a lot of great Photoshop work and whatever. Totally worth looking at his stuff. Um, he doesn't do um, as many step-by-step -step tutorials. He has a few like you can like look over his shoulder and he kind of speeds things up and you can kind of see what he's doing. But he doesn't really step-by-step -step walk you through. But in terms of looking at the end product, he does some of the best work out there, I think, um, in terms of visualization. And so anyway, these are example portfolio pages that he's worked on uh, that kind of identify some of his projects. Obviously, this is on the extreme professional end of ability. And I would never expect your abilities to match up with his. But at the same time, it's worth looking at how he, how he kind of lays stuff out. And so if we're looking at, at this particular example, this is a blank layout. right? It has a graphic piece. This text doesn't say anything. Right? It's just Latin to look like text. But he's using that as a placeholder to kind of look at this as an overall page. So if we look at these elements, he has these little 9 by 9 grids in the corners to kind of anchor the page. Um, I would imagine those could evolve into a personal logo or a page number or something. Right, as he went forward. But the point is, he has those two little pieces that anchor the page. He's got a really nice layout where we've got a nice large across the spread image, one image, right? Showcase piece. We talked a lot about layouts the last class. And when we were talking about those layouts, we were saying sometimes you just need a lot of space to show an image, right? So sometimes too many little things doesn't work. We've got a nice little headline, we've got a nice paragraph length to write about the project. Now, obviously, if you have that much space for text, that small, you must have a lot to write. right? And you have to create that. You have to write it. So there isn't a requirement in the world of this portfolio for this class to write big, long paragraphs. right? If you feel like you want to, then you should. If you don't feel like you want to or you're uncomfortable doing it, then work your way, design your way around small bits of text, not large bits of text. So next page in the same portfolio, or maybe you know, a page later on in the portfolio, the 9 by 9 squares are, again, in the upper corner, consistent page to page. So that's something that's going to fall on every single page. And then we have some similarities. The fonts are the same. right? The sizes are the same for the text here and the text here. We have one large image. But notice that in this case, we flipped. So if I jump back for a second, right? the pages are reflections. Oops, that was forward, sorry. Right? This has a relationship to this. When we go to the next page, that's the same as what was on the other side. So there's a consistency. There's an underlying framework for how these pages are laid out. right? So that consistency stays the same. Obviously, before the text and everything was here, now it's the image. And it's the full bleed color image. Then we get into this, where we have smaller text, but this piece that we're looking at now is broken up into these little volumes. So he's taken the basic framework and he's broken it down. So we're still playing within the same framework, same column layout. Um, it's just different vocabulary of what's actually on the page. So this is actually from his, quote, real portfolio. Um, he's done, I think, three sample portfolios. You can actually buy them if you want to look at the printed version of it. Um, but this is a set of pages for one project in his portfolio. Obviously, great visuals. It always helps in a portfolio when you have really great visuals. But at the same time, he's using some of the same techniques of that sample portfolio in his real portfolio. Right? He has the little logo in the upper corners that tie the project together. And we're going to see that on every page consistently. Um, and he's used, this one's a little bit more free, but the fonts are going to be the same consistent, consistently. Right? And he has this little bar that runs across the bottom to highlight his little um, sketches. Let's advance one more. Notice that that bar right, falls here and goes all the way across. When we look at the next page, oops, sorry, I'm going in the wrong direction. There's that bar, but it's at the top. So there's a consistency of this vocabulary as he's going through and showing each page of this particular portfolio. To me, the colors on this page make it really awkward because it's so yellow and kind of orange. And I think it would be a little bit cleaner if it was lighter in color. But our, our little logos are still there page to page. So there's a consistency again. Um, and this is a little bit more free. But notice that there is a strong break here that still divides this into those 
even page. Um, you know, and I, I wouldn't be surprised if that's very golden section-esque in its size, or very close to it. So this page breaks the mold quite a bit. This is still the same, text is still the same, but on the opposite page, we're down in the lower corner. So I don't know how successful that is. Um, it might or might not be a, a good idea. And obviously, he thought it was. I don't know that I would have, uh, have done it. And part of the nature of, of showing portfolios up on the board is it's really easy to pick them apart. And it's really easy to point out little things and whatever. So obviously, I'm going to be more critical. But at the same time, I think it's worth talking about. We've lost that, that bar that runs across the page. Um, but we've kind of replaced it with just two images, rather simple. This one could have been an image from one of his boards right? that he's just replacing as a full, full color image. That one is kind of a same, similar idea. But we have a consistency here of one, two, three columns, one, two, three columns, page to page. This one's just pretty because the <laughs> graphics are really nice. But this gives you an idea of how good he is at what he does. right? <laughs> Bottom column is that bar, like that black bar, right? Notice the division still occurs here as a little white piece. So this ties together with the rest of the portfolio. So you can see the fabric of the for portfolio is very, very similar page to page, but it's so subtle that you don't focus on it. One of the temptations in designing a portfolio is that you spend too much time creating this great portfolio, and that dominates your work, rather than your work really being allowed to breathe. So something like this is extraordinarily subtle as we go back and forth in the pages. But at the same time, it gives us a nice organization. It gives us a certain expectation of what's going to end up happening on any given page. Remember, upper corner, those are the same. Title of the project is the same. Font size is the same, consistently all the way across. And that's something that's very, very important. So let's look at another example. I have no idea who this person is, not related to DVC in any way. I picked their portfolio um, off of issue. And so I, like I said, I encourage you to, to look that up and to see it. So cover design is always really important. right? So what does the cover really look like? How does it showcase you as a designer really well? Some people believe in the blank white cover with a tiny bit of text. I, I fell in that category when I did grad school. I just wanted a very clean, nothing fancy, no big color images or anything. Sometimes people like the black and white. Um, in this particular example, a little bit of extra Photoshop work makes this little piece of model stand out. This person must like to build models. right? So if they're telling a story about themselves and the model's on the cover, chances are they really like to build models. And that's telling us something about themselves. So when you do your own portfolio, and you're designing your cover, you want to think about what does that tell you about you as a person. OK, so next spread for them. Um, this is what I was talking about. This is the introductory set of pages. OK, so you open that portfolio. The first thing that you see is information about themselves. right? So here he is. Here's information about himself. Talks about education, his experience, and his skills. Right? Maybe this is a bit overkill. This is almost resume-esque, probably looking for a job having this information included. Some of the portfolios in the back will include this information. Some won't. Again, it's a personal portfolio. It's your choice. And as much as I like to mandate, <laughs> you have to do this or you have to do that, portfolio is a very personal thing. You have to decide if this is appropriate for you or not as part of it. But I like to introduce it because I think it's not a bad idea. I think the table of contents or the introduction about the projects is important. And that should fall in the beginning of your portfolio. So in this example, here's this student work. He's giving us page numbers. He's giving us the title of what the projects are. And he gives us a tiny little tidbit of a graphic of what this project is about. And I think that's a really good way of kind of identifying what's going on in this particular um, portfolio and what we're looking forward to seeing and where those fall on a particular page. Notice there's definitely a hierarchy of text that's been established here. right? We're using all caps in some places. We're using you know, mixed case in other places. We have a nice, big, bold you know, content. We have a subheading for student work. The page numbers are bold, uh, but not quite as bold as this. And then we've got the, the, the mixed case, much thinner text. So there's a nice established hierarchy. The same stuff happens here as part of his resume. So all of that ties together as part of the portfolio, rather than being disparate pieces. Right, so we move to one of his sample pages in the portfolio. Okay. Similar here, 
We've got the big bold text. That was the same as what said content. Then we have a subheading underneath. Again, same as the first set of pages. Then we have the small bit of text that identifies this project. One of the, the temptations is to feel as though this text has to fill up all the white space. Right? It doesn't. Right? This reads just fine. Okay? He obviously included a little line here at the bottom with a little bit of information about the project. That would be footer information, extra superfluous information that may be relevant. So he chose in this example to have the three stacked images and then the one big image for the rest of the, the other side of the page. Right? I don't have a lot of his images, um, but we'll skip to another portfolio. Again, front page of the portfolio. Apparently the trend in the ones that I picked are the black pages, but you know, so be it. I should have included a white page. Um, but in this case, very, very simple, very plain. No information about them whatsoever. Um, when we move on, they chose not to have um, information about themselves here, just a table of contents about the projects. And in this case, it's a very simplified version. right? We just have a page number and the title of the project. Right? So if we go back and we look at the one that was two ago with the little tiny drawing, maybe that was more successful. Maybe we got more interested in that particular project because it had a little drawing associated with it. I don't know. But it's certainly something to think about. So in this case, it wasn't on the first page. It's on the next page. Right? So here's the resume information, education, and that sort of thing. So again, this is probably about job more than anything else. But consistency of font, size, hierarchy. And then we move into the actual pages. And I couldn't resist giving, you know, I picked this because I liked some of the graphics. Um, but same font following through. But we've got a nice hierarchy that works its way down. One of the tricky things when you do a full color image like this and you want the white text on the colored background is generally you have to make the text a little bit bigger and a little bit thicker because it's much harder to read. Okay, So in this case, this text is a little bit thicker. I would argue that right in here against the white, it's pretty hard to read. And so if, if, if I were doing this, maybe the layout needs to change and the text needs to go against something that's not the brightest part of the image. And so you kind of have to think through that, both in relation to how does it fit with the graphic design, but also in relation to what's the background image and, and how does that impact your overall piece. Let's move forward a second. Right? Again, this particular page different than the last page. This is a little bit more free form and layout, but each page is carefully considered with how they're coming together. Uh, and so we get these kind of unique graphics and how they, they come together as a full bleed. Right? So we're going all the way both left and right, but the color transitions really nicely across the spread. Next page in the portfolio, much more technical based. So the last one was a little bit more free form. But there is definitely a three column here and a four column there uh, for how those two are working. Uh, and it gives us a pretty good organization. Again, all the fonts are the same. The sizes and the hierarchy are the same consistently. One of the challenges when you're looking at this sort of thing is if you did boards for a particular project, you prepared stuff for 121 or you prepared stuff for 220, at that time, you may have chosen a font that was different than the font you chose for your portfolio. And so you have to decide, do you cut up your boards and reimagine it as part of the portfolio? Or do you try to include, this is what I presented with? Most of the time, if you cut it up, you're going to end up with a better portfolio than just trying to drop the boards in themselves. So uh, this is Bashir's portfolio. I think he's still around occasionally here. Anybody know him? You've met him before, maybe, at least, right? Uh, he was a student here. I included his because I think it was particularly well done. Um, this was not the portfolio that he turned in for this class. <laughs> he had one version that he turned in for this class, and then he worked on it all winter break. And this was the one that came out of winter break. Much better uh, version of it. But at the same time, I like to like something like this because it's a direct example of something that somebody here in your shoes, doing the same classes you're taking, chose to, to put together. So you can see the, the, the way that they work together. So first spread, we have a nice index. We have a lot about, right? We go intro, projects, or notice Mondrian Museum, Calder Museum, sound familiar, right? Then we go into the digital tools and fabrication, Rhino and V-Ray, AutoCAD, those kinds of things. This is the showcase about technical skills that I have. This is the stuff about design. And he's organized it such that we see the design stuff first, because that's most important. And then we have other stuff about, um, you know, these are the kind of technical skills that I have. It's possible this theory section, I don't know that this all should be categorized as theory. But 
Now that's, that's how he chose to categorize it. So let's jump forward a page and see what it looks like. So we move from that into an introduction page. Right? Very simple, very clean introduction page. Talks about him and his interests, right? where he started, et cetera. So rather than having the resume set up, in this case he has a written narrative about himself with a few nice sketches that complement it in a nice clean page. Right? Notice that the font is consistent. Move forward, consistent. Right? So you can see that I'm emphasizing this consistency page to page. So let's look here, right? Mondrian Museum sketches. This is starting into the project section. Right? So this is the projects. I'm going to start with my Mondrian Museum, and I have a few sketches. And then we move into the actual museum. It's so tempting to over-include information. And I think one of the things that he did a very nice job of was identifying really key pieces that happen as part of his design and distilling those down into, you know, here's my light study. These are the things that I'm interested in. Here's a few in-process study models with a little bit of narrative about my process, coupled with here's my final drawings, plans, and one nice elevation. Not overdone, not too much, not trying to cram too much into one page. Very clear, this is what this particular design project was about. We move into the next one. Calder Museum is, a, is, a, is one in, in the case of this. I don't know whether they've cut this out or not, um, but they used to do, no, no, they still do the project, but I don't know whether you have to do drawings as part of it anymore. Um, there used to be no drawings, so it was model only. So in this particular example, you're emphasizing the model itself and what you were trying to study through doing the model. And so there aren't any drawings to couple with it. So we've got a little bit of information. If I were to go back and pick on these two pages a little bit, the biggest thing that I would pick on is the, the, the way that the, the cases are kind of screwy. right? So we have that whatever, we've got all these in capitals. And then when we get to something like this, this is all lowercase. It just doesn't quite fit right. right? He's consistent page to page to page. But it seems somehow to, like, you, if you're squinting at this, you almost focus on about rather than Calder Museum. So you just want to think and make sure that that hierarchy, even though it's bigger and obvious that that's the title, you want to make sure that that really works nicely. Obviously, as part of something like this, really nice photograph makes a big difference. Okay, so this is a great photograph, good sun study, good light. We've got all the shadows in here. The focal point is actually in front of the, the the actual model, which may or may not be an advantage, right? Depends on the quality of the model when you built it. Um, I think this one as a compliment is really nice because he's getting inside what this building feels like, what the light feels like in this building. The only thing that could have made that better is that person was sitting right in here too. So we had a sense of scale, right? It happened to be a really well-built model. But the point is this, this works really nicely as a spread, right? Again, not too much information. One big picture, one small picture, that's it. Tells us all we need to know. We move forward into a kind of a rendering that he did. This was a set of group work, right? So you notice that on the, the title page, the big image and whatever, Serpentine Pavilion, boom. It's obviously a group. There's four people that worked on it. So he's not trying to claim this as just his work. And that's really critical that you do. So here's some of the, the sections um, and the, the elevations and the about. Um, section. I don't know that I like calling it about, um, but you know, maybe there's some other way of describing it. But again, I'm being nitpicky. I told you it's really easy for me to stand up here after the fact and pick on little things, right? And you'll find that when you show me examples of your portfolio and I pick on little things, I can get really, really picky. And that's because every time you show it to me, the better it gets, the more picky I can be, right? In the, in the beginning, we talk about big scale stuff. And as we go forward, it's like, well, the spacing in between these two photos isn't right. And we can get into the really fine detail, but that's part of what makes a really good portfolio. So we have a nice strong line. These two pieces line up nicely horizontally. right? Likewise, this lines up at the, that lower column. So two column layout, essentially. I mean, I guess you could split this column into the two columns of text. Maybe if we put them together, it would feel a little bit better. Uh, but you want to think about how those, how those kind of come together. Right? Flow line stays consistent right? on these two subsequent pages. This had to do with about the, the fabrication and how they put stuff together and their little LED wiring diagram, whatever. I guess beyond my realm, right? But they included that because that was a lot about what this was about. 
Um, this was out of 136, the rendering, the table and chair rendering. Um, so I'm showing you for those of you that are in 136, I can't help myself. Um, this was not his original rendering of the table and chair. This was something that he did a little bit later once he had more skill. Uh, but he went back and he created the one nice quality rendering to showcase skill. So I fast forwarded a bit in the, uh, in the process because I wanted to show you kind of the, the, the skill set pieces of the portfolio, right? So this is much more about the skill of I can create this beautiful rendering than it is about the whole design process and whatever. Okay, so sometimes you need these kinds of pages in it as well. Okay, so I'll stop talking. Those are my examples uh, for now. But I will point out in the very back here, I brought over, and I tend to do this, uh, and I'll do it a couple times during the semester. I brought over sample portfolios from previous semesters. Right? People tend to leave them behind. I tried to cull through, um, and I'll spend a little bit more time going through and making sure I think all of these portfolios got A's, I think. Um, but I'll, I'll go back through. I, I don't want to show you ones that didn't. In the past, I usually just brought the whole stack over, and I was trying to cull out and kind of just show you the better stuff so that you can do it. Um, some of them go back in time. I think this was like 2008 or something, but it's still probably one of the best ones that's ever been done. Um, so I put this one on top so you can look at that one. Uh, but then you can kind of dig through. Um, sometimes some of these are updated. Uh, some of them are not updated. Um, different, different work. So, you know, here's an example, right, of kind of the intro page. I don't think this was particularly well done in the intro page. However, his spreads are really, really nice, right? They work nicely. I tried to, I wanted to use his as an example, but he didn't end up uploading the, the digital copies. But so you can see that these work nicely as overall spreads. Um, and so really take your time, look through these, right? This one doesn't even have text on it, but it's nice. Um, so take your time, look through these, get yourself some ideas, what works, what doesn't work, what feels right, what doesn't feel right. Um, recognizing, of course, that these are not completely the perfect ones, but at the same time, these are the best of what uh, I've seen. Um, so spend some time, look at those as kind of getting going. And then I'm also going to show you um, kind of a bunch of how InDesign works in this multi-page world. So hang on for a second while we uh, switch the computers here, and then we'll start talking InDesign. Okay, so we're going to um, open up the world of InDesign, and today I'm really going to focus on this whole idea of creating a, a booklet or a multi-page layout. Thus far, everything we've done has been just a, a, a single page, a single postcard or a single uh, poster, etc. You guys are obviously working on your uh, lecture series poster, which is again a single page. But in order to work on the portfolio, we have to start talking about this as a multi-page um, layout. And so there, the good news about InDesign is it's designed for this particular purpose, and we have a lot of built-in things that will help us kind of build out the portfolio. So I'm going to go ahead and create a new document. And so in this case, I'm going to do a letter-sized in a landscape format. So eight and a half by 11, so that in, in this example, my portfolio you know, will look like this, and it will open like that. Okay? Um, I'm going to leave the checkbox for facing pages, because I want to design this as a spread, where I have content on the left and content on the right. It is up to you, and you'll see in the back that some of the portfolios are just single-sided, just one side per page. Uh, it's up to you as to which one works for you. Um, when the grad school requirements that I said when I applied to, to Berkeley, and they, they very easily could have changed by now. I actually think you have to turn in a digital one instead of a print one. But anyway, the uh, point being that um, when I was limited to 12 pages. So if I did back and front, I got 24 total pages that I could work with. If I did just single-sided, then I only had 12. So sometimes you end up having to do back and front uh, or facing pages because you want that extra information. For today's purposes, I'm going to choose to do it as um, a landscape format that is facing. So I'm leaving the, the checkbox here. I'm going to set my margins to zero for right now. I could set these to whatever the printer margins were. One of the challenges that you'll find here at DVC is that our printers do not print full bleed, so we can't go all the way to the edges of the page. Um, if you want to do full bleed and print here and not take it to a print shop, 
um, you would need to basically shrink to fit the page and then crop it or print each page on a larger page and cut them down uh, so that you get that, that, that full size uh, page. And so that's the nature of it. There is something called bleed, uh, which you see down here, which is an extension of the colored image beyond the cropped area of the page. Um, so if, for example, I had my spread and it looked something like this, right? There's the division, right? If I had an image and I wanted for sure to have it go all the way off the page, right? I'd place my image in and I'd use something called bleed, which goes beyond the edge of the page so that when I placed my image, all right, let's say it went in there, it would actually go off the edge so that when a printer went to print it and then cut the page after the fact, if they were a little bit off in their alignment, the image would still go all the way off the edge of the page. You wouldn't have a little white stripe or something. Um, and this is what happens all the time in the world of magazines. So like, let's say you, you pick up you know, Time Magazine or Money Magazine or whatever. They have images that go full bleed. They go all the way across the page or they cover up um, the, whole, the whole spread. And when they do that, they have this little bleed that goes around the outside of the magazine so that when they print, you know, millions of these copies and then the printer cuts them and whatever, if the printer machine is off just a little bit or doesn't quite cut this one perfect, it still acts as a full bleed page. So that is right here under bleed. So if I wanted to set this, if I wanted to do full page uh, pictures, I would set this um, at, you know, maybe a sixteenth of an inch. So point, um, what is it, 0625? Right, isn't that a sixteenth of an inch? Um, let me make sure it is. Point. Point one two five is an eighth. Point. Well, we'll just do it at point one two five. That's an eighth. All right. And so then I'll go ahead and say okay. And when I do that, you see that I have my page itself that we're used to seeing. But then see how I get this extra red border that goes all the way around the outside? That's that bleed line. So if I wanted an image to be full size. I would go and, and make it go all the way to that bleed line if I was cutting. A sixteenth of an inch is probably enough. Um, so you didn't need to, to do the eighth of an inch. Um, I probably can go back and edit that after the fact. If I went to uh, document setup, yeah, there, under bleed, I could say um, whatever, point six two five would have been in. Yeah, there's a sixteenth of an inch. So a sixteenth should be enough. I shouldn't be so far off that I can't do it. Okay, so now if we look, and I'm in under the advanced uh, workspace here. If I click on pages, right, and we look at the pages window as it comes up, we see that I have page one. It's highlighted in this light blue, and I have the the seam of the two pages, right, or the binding of those two pages, identified by a slightly longer line. If I were to continue and create two more pages, I'm going to come down here to the new page button and click it twice to get two new pages, we'll see that that's the first page, second, third, with the seam in the middle. So what I'm looking at right now is pages two and page three, right, that span across those two. Um, and this would be the seam. We will talk at length a little bit later in the semester about binding. Um, how you choose to bind the page can be um, important when you think about where the images are placed and, and what happens to the images. But we'll talk about that a little bit later in the semester. It's, it's too much to, to worry about for right now. So for the sake of, of doing my work, I'm really going to start laying stuff out on pages two and three. Those are going to be on my first pages. Page one is kind of like the title page, right? or it's that first page in the portfolio. Maybe it's a table of contents. You kind of have to decide what's the right, right piece of that. Um, so I'm going to work on pages two and page three. So you guys remember last class when I set up that whole complicated way of, of arranging the page and, and um, establishing the various columns and the column widths and whatever. I'm going to do the exact same thing with this group of page, pages. But I'm going to do something slightly different. One of the things that um, the world of InDesign lets us have is it has something called masters. And if you look on the pages, there's kind of this double line in the pages window. And above it, you see something called a master. And then below it, these are the actual pages. So what masters are is it's, it's content that goes on a page that can be repeated page after page. So if, for example, I wanted to put a page number on a page, if I put that page number on the master, it would automatically show up on every page that had the a master applied to it. Okay? So I'm going to do my layout work 
on a master page such that it will end up on any page that I create afterward. So I'm going to work on the A master. And to get to the A master, I actually have to double click on the A master. And you see that it highlights in blue. Uh, and I can see it right here as being highlighted in blue. Now this looks identical to pages two and pages three. Okay? But if I were to put something on the page, let's say I put a frame on the page, something like that, it's on the master. It's right here. But if I go to pages two and three, let me double click on page three, lo and behold, there's that frame. So anything I do on a master appears on any page that has that master applied to it. And we can tell that it has the A master applied to it because in the upper right corner of the page or the upper left corner of the left page, I see a little A. You guys see that? Okay. So that little A right there indicates that it's an A master. I can create as many masters as I want. I can have a B master, a C master, a D master, all to help this, this general layout. I'm going to jump back up to the A master for a second. And I'm going to start laying out my work. So let's go ahead and get rid of that text frame. And I'm going to do the same strategy that I did last class uh, to establish um, kind of the general layout for these two pages as a starting point. Um, so I'm going to switch into inches first. So we'll switch my, my units into inches. And notice because this is a spread, 0 starts at this upper left corner. And we go all the way to 22 instead of 11 because it's both pages together. So I'm really designing these as a continuous um, set of two pages. And I'm actually going to shrink this down for a little bit. And I'll make this smaller. Now, we also established a layer for my guides. I'm going to do the same thing that I did before with a non-printing guides layer. So let me go ahead and add a new layer. I'll double click on the name of it, and we'll call it guides. And I'm going to uncheck the print layer checkbox here. Say OK. Now this layer is a non-printing layer. So anything that I draw on it won't show up in the final print. OK. So now with the guides layer active, I'm going to go ahead and draw my x's. So I'll start with the line tool. And I'm going to go from the upper corner here to the lower corner down there. Now the line that I drew was black. I'm going to change that line color to red. And we'll also change the stroke, which is the thickness, so that it's a little bit thicker so that you guys can see it better. And then I'll do the same thing from this corner up to that corner. Now, unfortunately, I have a little window in the way, so let's get rid of that. And we'll go from there to there. So you guys remember that I crossed the, the two lines. Like that. Let's see if I can select it. Come on. Make it red. And again, I'll make it a little fatter. I should have changed it so that all of my lines were like that. OK, and then I'm going to draw just the line that goes from here up to there, and from there over to there. So I'm going to work the same way. I'll pull a line down. I'm going to hold down Shift as I do this. And we'll go at maybe a half inch. And then I'll pull this over to where those two meet, right there. I'll pull this one over to where those meet. I'll pull this to right there. I'll pull this to right here. And we'll pull this to right across there. Okay, So I've established kind of the general region that I'm going to be working in. Okay, I'm going to establish my flow line next. So I'll go to where those two cross. And then I'll split that. Right about there. That one's going to be my flow line. I'm actually going to get rid of this one altogether so it's not distracting. And then I want to measure how far it is from here to here so that I can divide this into the proportionate. Uh, remember, I multiplied by 0.618. So let me go ahead and really quickly, I'll draw a line that goes from this guide over to here. Hold down Shift so that it's, it's in place here. Uh, looks like it's 9. 
It's about nine inches. Yeah, it jumps to 9.04. So let me take 9.04. I'm going to open up a calculator here, hopefully. And so we had 9.04 times 0.618 equals, oops, that was not correct, 9.04 times 0.618 equals 5.586, so 5.59. Uh, and so let's go ahead and drag this, oh, I can't drag it quite yet because I need a line. Get rid of this line, go in this direction, and I said 5.59, right? 5.59, and there's that division. Take this, put it over here. Same thing like that. So now, with all of these lines kind of established of where, where my flow lines are, uh, where my titles would go, et cetera, um, if I go back to my pages and we look at, say, pages two and three, we see that pages two and three and even page one have all of this information already on them. If I were to create more pages, say four and five, right? pages four and five have all of that information on them. So whatever I put, on this master page is going to ultimately be applied to all the rest of my pages, which is a really big advantage. Okay, everything's ex in exactly the same place. I could take it to the next step, and let me instead of having two, just the A master, I'm going to actually duplicate the master here. So let me right click on A master, and I'm going to say duplicate master spread, and you see that now I have A master and B master. Okay, so let's work on B master for a second. There it is. And let's say that I put a frame in for right there. That was going to be an image. And maybe I'll put a frame in for the overall size over here. Something like that. Now, these two frames I do want to print, and they're currently on the non printing layer. So let me take each of those. I'm holding down Shift to select them. And I'm going to change their layer to be on layer 1. And I can do that once they're selected by dragging this little box from the guides layer to the layer 1 layer. That little red box represents the objects themselves. And that's how you move an object from one layer to another. So they're now on the blue layer, or layer 1. I can actually leave layer 1 highlighted here. And then we can go back to pages. And so if we look at pages 2 and 3 here, Press Control-0 and then minus. Okay, I still have the A master applied, so those boxes that I, sh that I drew don't show up. So if I instead apply the B master, I'll right click and say apply master to pages. Instead of the A master, I'll pick the B master. And now that little text frame shows up. Notice that this one still has the A applied, so I'd have to go back, apply master to pages. And we'll go to B master, say OK. So now I have those two images. If I wanted to place an image, I would just go to File and then Place. And I'd pick my image. And all I have to do is click inside of this frame, and the image would then fill that particular frame. And then I can go to Right Fitting, uh, right Click flit, Fitting, uh, Fill Frame Proportionally. There it is. I can do the same thing again for this one. I'll go to File and then Place. I'll pick a different image. And it'll go inside there, right click, fitting, fill frame proportionally. And there it is. If I went into my view screen mode preview, we'd see that those are just the, the images that I have. So let's say that I wanted to add a little bit more to this. right? I'm happy with my two images, but let's go back to my screen mode normal. Let's say I wanted to work on some text. Now, I'm going to go ahead and do a little line that goes right here. And that line is going to be 
in black. And it's also going to be thinner, in like one point. And then I'm going to go ahead and put a text box here and start to establish what the title should look like. So let's change it. I'll do Arial for now. And we'll say, let's do Arial Bold. Yeah. And maybe this needs to be a little bit larger. And then maybe underneath it, I'll put something else, but it won't be in bold. Regular, much smaller. Uh, architecture 121. Something like that. Okay. Now these really need to come down a little bit more to line up with my little line here. And so I've put that in. Right? I could also have a little bit of text that would go maybe below here, something like that. That's just a placeholder for a second. Let me change this to again be in Arial, regular, but we'll do this one in 8. And this would be whatever. Something like that. Now, the text is here, and it's in those text boxes. If I went to my pages, right, and we looked at, say, page 3 here, and I went to the View menu, and I went to Screen Mode, Preview, we can see that I've now established kind of what this is going to look like page after page. And so if I had the B Master applied down here, Apply Master to Pages, B Master, OK, we get and we'd see there's the same text. Now, the problem with text, if it's on the master, is you can't edit it anymore. So in this case, I can't go in and I can't say, no, I didn't want it to be the Mondrian Museum. So a lot of times what I'll do is I'll establish first what the text looks like on the master page. But ultimately, I'll move myself up to the master, and I'll take each text box, and I'll copy it. I'll go Edit, Copy. And then I'll come to the page that it's on, and I'll go to Edit, Paste in Place. When I select Paste in Place, it puts it in the exact same place that it was on the master. So we'll paste it in place, and it's there. I'll go to this page, and I'll go to Edit, Paste in Place. It's there again. And I'll come back up to the master, and I'll actually delete the text boxes. So I end up with just the line. And now it's still here, but it's editable. So I can go in, and I can change it. So text is the one thing that doesn't work that well on a master. The only thing that will work is if you place text. So if you have a Word file with the stuff in it and you do a file place, it will show up and, and place it into a box that's empty on your master. So if you have an empty text box and you reference a file, it'll show up. But you can't actually double click and actually type in it. It's one of the, the quirky things about it. So I now have the, the Mondrian Museum. Let me get the Latin sample text so that we can fill that up a little bit more. Right. Here is, uh, let's see if we have it here. Right. So here's some, here's some text here that's randomly generated. This is Latin that's meant to look like actual sentences. Does that make sense? So it doesn't say anything. It's gibberish. But rather than just pounding out letters on the keyboard, this looks like it's written text. So I'm going to use that for just a second in my paragraph here. So we can kind of see what it would look like with some sample text in it and whether the font size is right. I think it actually probably should be a little bit smaller. That feels a little bit better in the, in the hierarchy of things. Let me go ahead and, and do the same thing. I'm just going to copy this. So Control C. Remember, Edit, Paste in Place puts it right on top. 
And then let me get rid of that piece. So we can kind of see what it looks like. We can see, do I like it? Does it, does it fit nicely on a flow line? Maybe I need to adjust if I press Control-0. Uh, we can kind of look, is my spacing right? That sort of thing. This might not be the most attractive thing in the world. Maybe I want the image to get smaller so that it, it's all below that little line, uh, in which case I can go back to the master. Let me go to view. Sorry, I'm in. Why can't I find it? There we go. View, screen mode, normal. I can see my, my lines again. Let's drop this to be even with that line. And let's come over here to this one. And we'll either, well, on this one, let's go full, full bleed all the way off the edge for contrast. All right, so now when I go back, remember, I just made those adjustments. I just shrunk the image down, and I just made this one larger. Oh, it looks like it didn't quite do it. Let me just delete those for a second. And apply master to pages. I'm going to go back and apply the B master so that I get those frames back again. Apply master to pages. B master. There we go. And I'll replace. So I'll go to file and then place. And I'll right click fitting, fill frame proportionally. And then we'll come file, place. Oops, sorry. There, fitting, fill frame proportionally. And let me press control zero so we can see both spreads. So there they are. If I go up to my window, excuse me, view, screen mode, preview, right? We can start to see how these pages are working as a unit. So in that case, I kept that line consistent with where the top of this is. You have to decide what's appropriate or what looks right. Recognize that I could take this a step further. And again, I can go back up to the master to do this. And I could say that actually, I wanted the whole top half of this page to be gray instead of having this little line here. So maybe I would turn back on my normal screen mode, and then maybe I'd add a box. And let's flip the color so it's filled. And let's change that fill color to be a light gray. So I'm going to do maybe 25% uh, gray, something like that. Say OK. There's that gray. I don't want there to be a stroke, so I have to make sure it has the slash through it. And I do want it to be all the way full bleed off the edges of the page. And if I were to take this and look at it on, say, this page, now that gray is now there. So you see how it, it works? right? Any change that I make on the master ends up uh, applying on the page itself. So now let's say that I wanted to add page numbers to my particular page. Now, I should also point out that this might not be the most attractive graphic design piece in the world. I'm trying to show you the skills, not do the best design. <laughs> okay? So yours will look better than mine, I promise. So let's say I wanted to include a page number. So InDesign has this great feature that will automatically number pages for you if you want it to. So I'm going to create a text box. And inside that text box, I'm going to make sure that my font is set up correctly. So this was an Arial. And we'll leave it at 12 point, but I'm going to do it in bold. And then I'm going to go to the Type menu, and I'm going to go to Insert Special Character Marker Current Page Number. And when I do that, all I get is a B. Well, that's because I'm on the B master right now. So then I'll, I'll take this little piece of text, and I'll put it right where it belongs, wherever that would be. Maybe it's something like that. And let me go ahead, and I'm going to copy this same piece of text, Control-C. And I'm going to move it on over here. By the way, I held down spacebar to pan. And let me go to V. Now, this needs to be the opposite justification. Like that. And we'll put it in the same spot. So now I have a B there and a B there, which are just uh, page number markers. But if I go to 
anything that has the um, B master applied to it, you see that now this corresponds. This is page three, there's page number three. If I go to page five, there's page number five. If I go to page four, there's page number four. If, however, I go to page two, there's no page number there. And that is because the text that's on the B master is on the blue layer, right? And it's below the images on the layer. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to create one more layer. It's called layer three. And I'm going to rename this layer to be uh, master text. And I'll say OK. And I'm going to drag it so that it's at the very top of the layer stack. Then I'm going to make sure that each of these page numbers is on that master text layer. So I'll drag this little box up till it's on the master text layer. You see that these turn green because they're on a green layer. And now, no matter what I put on any of these pages, the page number is always going to be in the same place and above. So let's go down to page four. There it is. There it is. Right. I should probably change this to say Calder Museum just so we can tell the difference in the pages. OK. So that's page numbers. Now, InDesign can be even more sophisticated than just page numbers. I can also adjust how the page numbers are applied or what they look like. So for example, you see at the top of this page one, there's a little black triangle. That triangle represents what's called a section marker. Um, it's it's a, like a chapter, so to speak. If I went to page three here, and I right clicked on it, and I went to numbering and section options right here, I get this new section dialog box, choosing to start a section, and I can choose how to number it. I can start at page numbering at one. I could also choose that I want it to be numbers. I want it to be with leading zeros. I want it to be A, B, C, D. I could do Roman numerals, etc. So I have complete flexibility in what the page number looks like. I can choose what nu page number I want it to start with. The only um, thing here is that the odd numbers have to be on the right, and the even numbers have to be on the left. Um, that's just the way books are laid out. So you won't be able to change that. Um, so anyway, that would be starting a section. But I can also include a prefix and a section marker. So for example, this I could include a section marker for assignment one. Oops. 101. And that means that the section here, everything is assignment 101. The nice thing about that is that then means that in the B master, not only can I have the page number, but I could say type, got to love the weather, right? I could go to type, insert special character, markers, section marker. And when I do that, this is bigger than the space that I have on the page here. Let me make this a little bit smaller. OK, so I have a page number, and then I have a little thing that says section there. So when I go on to page three, it says three, assignment 101. OK, page four, oh, I didn't do it on page four. Hold on a second. Let me add the section marker on this page, too. To save time, I'm just going to copy it right from here. And we need to adjust so that it's justified the opposite way. And in this case, I want the page number to be on the other side of the text, like that. So I'm doing it backwards. Okay. So there it is. Now, on every page after page 2, so it says, or excuse me, page 3, assignment 101. Page four, assignment 101. Page five, assignment 101. See how it populates on every page? Now, if, I, if this was assignment 101 and this page was now assignment 102, I can right click and go to numbering and section options, start a new section, and this is now going to be um, right here under section marker, assignment 102. I can say OK. 
And now every page after that will be assignment 102. So this automatically populates no matter how many pages I have in, uh, inserted. And so if I add more pages, it'll just automatically. So it's a way of kind of working with the context of InDesign to, to add sophistication to your particular page. It's not necessary that you do it. I just like to at least show you that it's an option uh, for something that's available to you. Uh, let's see, what else? Uh, we already did the placements, the text. I think, that, I think that just about covers everything we need to cover for now. Um, if you guys have individual questions, by all means, uh, let me know, and we'll kind of work through it. You have two assignments done so far. You have assignment 101 and 102. That gives you some content to put on your page. If you have nothing other than assignment 101 and 102, I still think you could do a spread with just 101 and 102 to create two pages for today. If you um, have other stuff, if you've been working on, say, your folding cube thing, whatever it is, for 121, put that in. Right? The more content you have, the more practice you have putting stuff in, the better your portfolio is going to be. Remember, it's not a final version yet. You're just working out the kinks. You're trying to decide how stuff uh, is set up and what it looks like. Uh, the one other thing I should have pointed out is that these various text boxes that I established, I should really have paragraph styles and character styles assigned for them. If I did that at, down the road, if I decided that I didn't like this particular font and I wanted to change to a different font, really easy to just change the paragraph style and the character style, and then it would populate all the way through everything that I did in my document. Right? So don't forget to use those as a technique. Any questions? No? Yeah. So basically, our exercise is just a title and our previous work from assignment one to one. Yes, that would be ideal. So, absolute bare minimum, two pages that have assignment 101 and 102 on them. Right? I would encourage you to do as much as you can with as much content as you have, because the more you try to do and the more you try to put together, it's kind of your first draft at seeing what what works, what looks good, what doesn't look good. The other thing that I really want you to do is I want you to go in the back and I want you to look at all those portfolios. Uh, I should also point out, I, I mentioned that issue site. Um, it's worth looking at that as well. So if I went to ISSIU, something like that. I don't know, they, they spell it funny. Maybe it's ISSU, hold on. You, you, thank you. <laughs> Go figure. Uh, so anyway, this ISSUU probably stands for something. If you put in architecture portfolio, you can see that I picked a few of these already. Uh, but you can, you can choose to pick one, and it'll present you with kind of a, a graphic representation of what the pages look like. And you can start to see what, what looks good, what doesn't look good, uh, and how this stuff comes together. And again, it gives you kind of a good background. Um, and so these ones that are in the back are the actual live printed version that you can have in front of you. The ones that are on issue are, are good kind of computer generated ones. The difference is some of the people that are doing the computer generated ones are much further along in their architecture careers than you are. So, some of their some of their graphics may be much nicer than your graphics, um, but still s definitely something worth uh, worth kind of pursuing and thinking about um, for how they come together. Okay.